It was a big shot because I live nearby and I saw it from my windows. It's, uh, it's horrific. Russians lay flowers outside a Moscow music hall to mourn victims of Friday's fiery attack, while President Vladimir Putin says he knows who to blame. Welcome to Your World Tonight for Sunday, March 24th. I'm Kimberly Gale. Also on the program, more desperate pleas for humanitarian aid to enter Gaza. Sometimes I feel like I'm losing adjectives to describe just how horrific the situation is for children. And later, foreign correspondents in Rome get some fancy new digs, a 16th century palace and former political headquarters of one of Italy's most infamous leaders. Russia is observing a day of mourning. As authorities say, more than 130 people died in Friday's gun attack and fire at a Moscow concert hall. Work to identify the bodies continues. A number of people have been arrested, and an ISIS group has claimed responsibility. But as Briar Stewart tells us, the Kremlin is pushing another narrative. Kirill Smolyaninov took video as the gunmen started to storm the Moscow Concert Hall Friday evening. Some people fled in a panic, but he filmed four trying to shield themselves by crouching behind a metal pillar. Smolyaninov told CBC News that he then tried to escape. When I was on the escalator, I was actually shot at, he said. The photographer who was at the concert to film the band Picnic kept filming. As he looked down from the second floor, he thought he saw five or six shooters. Russian officials say four were directly involved in the carefully planned attack, which killed more than 135 people. This is a tragedy, Smolyaninov said. People died. They were living, enjoying life. They came to the concert, but instead this happened. <laughs> Russian officials say a large number of the victims died after the venue was set on fire and people were trapped underneath a collapsing roof. <laughs> Russia declared a national day of mourning Sunday and large crowds laid flowers in a heaping pile outside of the hall. It was a big shot because I live nearby and I saw it from my windows. It's, uh, it's horrific. And the big tragedy. A branch of ISIS claimed responsibility for the attack. According to an unverified video on Russian state media, one of the four men arrested said he recently returned to Russia from Turkey and was paid $7,000 to go to the concert hall and start shooting. In his address to the nation on the weekend, Putin promised vengeance but didn't mention ISIS. He pointed toward Ukraine, saying that the four who were arrested were headed there, and preliminary data suggested a window had been prepared to help them cross the border. Putin being the talented tactician that he is, he's trying to spin this to his own purposes. Sergei Rachenko is a professor at Johns Hopkins Advanced School for International Studies. He says Putin, who came to power at a time when Russia had been rocked by a series of terrorist attacks, has repeatedly vowed to make the country secure. But Putin appeared to disregard an alert from the U.S. earlier this month that warned extremists were planning to target large gatherings in Moscow. Putin publicly said the U.S. was attempting to destabilize Russia. The Russian government was foolish not to believe uh, those warnings or perhaps not to take any action to cope with those warnings and instead, uh, you know, focus focus all, all of their uh, attention on uh, coping with uh, political dissidents. Ukraine has denied being involved. President Volodymyr Zelensky says it's clear that Russia is just looking for someone else to blame. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, air raid sirens rang out through the night, sending people underground into subway stations in the capital, Kyiv. A series of Russian airstrikes came down on the city and in the western city of Lviv, targeting critical infrastructure. There's little detail on the extent of the damage. Sunday strikes come just two days after the largest aerial attack on Ukraine's energy system since the war began, which caused widespread blackouts. 
Poland's military says a Russian missile also briefly flew into Polish airspace, traveling about two kilometers over the country before crossing back into Ukraine. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris says an Israeli ground offensive in Rafah would be a huge mistake. The Biden administration has been urging their Israeli counterparts not to move on the southern Gaza city. Israeli officials say Rafah is Hamas's last remaining stronghold in Gaza. In an interview this morning with ABC News, Harris was asked what the U.S. will do if Israel launches an operation there. Well, we're going to take it one step at a time, but we've been very clear in terms of our perspective on whether or not that should happen. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. Speaking today from Egypt, the U.N. Secretary General warned an assault on Rafah would be a humanitarian catastrophe and called for more aid to be allowed into Gaza. Marina von Stackelberg reports. Inside a packed hospital in Rafah near Gaza's southern border with Egypt, chaos. A toddler is held in someone's arms, their tiny hand wrapped in gauze. Blood beads down their forehead as the child stares blankly at the scene around them. Medics treat several injured patients, including a man unconscious on the floor. The footage was captured by a freelancer in Gaza working for CBC News after an Israeli airstrike on a home just outside of Rafah. Today, another setback in attempts to get supplies into the besieged region. The main provider of humanitarian relief into Gaza, UNRWA, says Israel will now block all of its food convoys from entering northern Gaza. Israel has accused a dozen of UNRWA's employees of taking part in Hamas's October 7th attacks. The UN is investigating, but an interim report has found Israel has not provided more details of its allegations. Catherine Russell, the head of UNICEF, says children are starving to death in Gaza right now. That should never happen when we have the ability to stop it, when we have trucks waiting to go in there. Russell says Israel prevents anything from entering Gaza it decides could be used for something other than humanitarian relief. That would include sometimes things like little scissors that we put into a medical kit and they say that could be used as a as a weapon. We're having trouble now getting portable toilets in. We're not allowed to do that for a reason that we can't begin to understand. Russell says on a good day, about 100 aid trucks get into Gaza. Before the war, it was five times that. Palestinians in Gaza desperately need what has been promised, a flood of aid. Israel's decision to restrict aid in the north comes just after the head of the UN, Antonio Guterres, met with Egyptian officials pleading for aid into Gaza. Making that happen takes very practical steps. It requires Israel removing the remaining obstacles and shock points to relief. It requires more crossings and access points. As aid agencies fight to get food, medicine and other supplies in Gaza, Canada is still trying to get people out. Three months ago, Ottawa started a program to help Palestinian Canadians bring their extended family members to safety. Of nearly 1,000 applicants, only 14 have gotten out of Gaza. Immigration Minister Mark Miller says Canada will keep trying. For all our efforts, we do not control the Rafa gates. And on the other side of those gates, the devastation continues. More video captured by the CBC's freelancer shows an excavator dig through the rubble of a destroyed building. It then lifts a body wrapped in a blanket onto a waiting truck. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. In Nigeria, officials say about 130 students kidnapped more than two weeks ago have been freed. The students were taken in a mass abduction in northwestern Nigeria. Philip Lee Shanak has the details. When we had the, 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 our, our, our children are back, they're happy, people are happy, you know, jubilating. Jibril Guadabe is a traditional leader in Kariga. He says parents have been told the abducted children are now safe and in the state capital, Kaduna. Now they are taking care of them so that, you know, they have to go under some treatment before they hand over to us. They were released and recovered. Some of the children were seen at a media event where General Amos Towasima of the Nigerian army released details of their recovery. This is a result of uh, deliberate efforts by all security agencies to ensure the safe passage and recovery of uh, these abducted uh, children. Uh, thank God Almighty for making this possible for us. 
Nigerian authorities say the recovery of the missing children is proof of the government's commitment to keep communities safe and secure. And they say there's no reason for communities to pool savings in order to pay ransoms. Some are often forced to sell land, cattle and grain to secure their loved ones' release. They did not say it was a rescue mission. They said it was a release. But we don't know uh, exactly if um, there were any exchanges made. David Otto is with the Geneva Center for Africa Security and Strategic Studies. He says the kidnap for ransom industry in Nigeria continues to grow, even though the government has made paying ransoms illegal. It has made it very clear that no ransoms will be paid. So the social contract uh, is now in question in terms of how the government can protect Nigerians. It's one of the largest mass kidnappings since Boko Haram abducted nearly 300 girls from a school in Chibok a decade ago. Since then, at least 1,400 students have been kidnapped from Nigerian schools. Philip Lichenok, CBC News, Toronto. Canadian officials are bracing for Donald Trump's possible return to the White House. And that includes preparing to deal with policies that could end up hurting the Canadian economy. Trump is promising new tariffs that could make trade with the U.S. more expensive. Katie Simpson now on what Canada is doing to mitigate that threat. Canadian music echoed through the hallway of one of the busiest buildings on Capitol Hill. And the smell of French fries for poutine wafted through the air. The commotion drawing dozens of staffers and some of their lawmaker bosses to a Canada awareness event led by Canada's ambassador to the U.S., Kirsten Hillman. We're trying to sort of flood the hill, if I can be honest about it. Hillman summoned her most senior diplomats to Washington for dozens of meetings to open lines of communication with members of Congress, including Republicans supporting Donald Trump should he return to the White House. Canada may need those connections to help navigate Trump's unpredictable style of governing, especially in light of his promise to impose a 10% tariff on all goods imported into the U.S. So we will have a serious conversation with them if, if they're looking to apply that policy to us. But I think the starting point is that it shouldn't. Hillman says she believes Canada should be exempt because of the renegotiated North American Free Trade Agreement and has used these meetings to remind lawmakers of the billions of dollars in trade that goes between Canada and the U.S. every day. A message that seems to resonate with some of Trump's allies, including Republican Congressman Bill Huizinga. He says he doesn't see how Canada would be hit by the proposed tariff. I have a hard time believing that that would be the case, especially when it comes to the, uh, the trade agreement that he negotiated and, and led. But this long-term goodwill mission may end up being complicated by the looming Canadian election, where Trump is already a factor. Fake news. Fake news. The left-wing censorship regime. Their woke censorship ideology. The Liberal Party released an online attack ad negatively comparing Trump to conservative leader Pierre Polyev. Trump is known to be easily offended, and after criticism by Australia's ambassador to the U.S. was brought to his attention, Trump vowed to have him removed from his post. He won't be there long if that's the case. I don't know much about him. Uh, I heard he was a little bit nasty. Ambassador Hillman says Canadian political criticism of Trump hasn't come up in any of her conversations. And Republicans we spoke with, including Senator Kevin Kramer, also downplayed concern. I know Donald Trump very well, and he's, he's, a, very, um, he's a very secure man. He's a very confident guy. And he may weigh in on, on some things, but he doesn't hold long grudges. Several national polls show Trump is the favorite heading into the November election. And while the renegotiated NAFTA may protect Canada from any new Trump tariffs, that protection may be short-lived, as the deal has to be renewed in 2026. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Coming up on the program, we'll have this story. A good chunk of trees are coming down in Vancouver's Stanley Park. That's upsetting a lot of park goers. 160,000 trees is, is a heck of a lot of trees. I'm Yvette Brend. I'll tell you why. Coming up on Your World Tonight. Pakistani policewoman Sherbano Nakfi is being hailed as a national hero after footage of her rescuing a woman from an angry mob went viral. 
The reason for the mob's rage? They thought the Arabic calligraphy on the woman's clothing were verses from the Quran and accused her of blasphemy. The incident put the use of Pakistan's blasphemy laws back in the spotlight. Human rights activists say the laws are used to target religious minorities or to settle political scores and with very little evidence. Freelance reporter Abdul Sattar has more from Islamabad. Komal Rahman's life was turned upside down after her husband Imran was arrested. He was charged with blasphemy. Somebody used his cell phone to send blasphemous content, and the federal investigation agency arrested him. Komal's husband is facing a lifetime in prison. Uh, the fact is that a moment somebody is, just, is accused of blasphemy, not even formally charged, their lives are in jeopardy. Zohra Yusuf is a member of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. In Pakistan, uh, blasphemy uh, actually carries the death sentence, but so far no one has been executed by the state. However, over 80 people have been killed as a result of lynchings or people taking the law into their own hands. There are currently 40 people convicted for blasphemy on death row in Pakistan, according to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedoms. Accusations of blasphemy in Pakistan can lead to mob justice including attacks on the homes of the accused and even whole neighborhoods. A Christian Pakistani woman who fears for her life has found refuge in Canada. Pakistan's most infamous blasphemy case was that of Christian farm worker Asya Bibi. Her neighbors accused her of insulting Islam's prophet Muhammad after an argument. She spent nearly a decade in prison before receiving asylum in Canada. Her case led to widespread protests and the assassination of Punjab Governor Salman Taseer and the Minister of Religious Minorities who both supported Asya Bibi. Yusuf says this culture of fear makes the actions of the lady police officer Sayyada Shehar Banu Naqvi all the more remarkable. <laughs> Naqvi is being called a hero after she stopped a group of men from attacking a woman wearing a dress with Arabic calligraphy on it. By standard video shows her calming the crowd and physically escorting the terrified woman through the mob to safety. <laughs> She was scared, she was trembling, she thought that she would be killed. Nakvi says the memory of recent mob violence and vigilante justice triggered by blasphemy accusations made her determined to act. I jumped in because nobody should be allowed to blotch the image of a country which is trying to, to revamp itself and move in the right direction. Last August, mobs attacked Christian communities in eastern Pakistan setting fire to churches and homes after two Christian men were accused of blasphemy. Analyst Tosif Ahmed Khan blames the political establishment for encouraging fanatics. In reality, the Pakistani state uses religious extremism as a tool, and if it wants to create problems for a person, its agents hurl allegations against that person. For CBC News, I'm Abdul Sattar in Islamabad. In the heart of Rome, just a short drive from the Colosseum, sits a 16th century palazzo. For more than 20 years, it was the residence of one of Italy's most controversial leaders, billionaire Silvio Berlusconi. By day, he would hold political meetings there, and at night, his notorious bunga bunga parties. Now the palazzo has new tenants, some of Berlusconi's most hated enemies, the foreign press. Megan Williams got a tour of their new office. The head of Italy's Foreign Press Association, Esma Cacir, shows off the new office for foreign correspondents in Rome. It's a sumptuous palace with soaring ceilings and frescoed walls. A palazzo that for more than two decades, Italy's former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi called home. 
Adesso stiamo entrando nella stanza dove era la camera del letto di Berlusconi. Ok, so we've just entered into the bedroom of Silvio Berlusconi. The corner room where the former leader slept still has the bulletproof windows he had installed. Low light switches betray where his bed once was. The double-sized canopy once belonged to the Soviet ruler Joseph Stalin, a gift to Berlusconi from his close friend, Russian President Vladimir Putin. These days, Kachur and five other correspondents rush to meet deadlines in the room. She says it's no small triumph. The world's press has taken over Berlusconi's old digs. Più di 20 anni non veniva a fare la conferenza stampa alla stampa estera. For more than 20 years, Berlusconi refused to give press conferences with foreign journalists, she says. He came once, said the questions were offensive, and never returned. The three-time prime minister also controlled the state broadcaster, while owning most of Italy's private TV stations and papers. Berlusconi's corruption scandals and his bunga bunga sex parties made headlines around the world, presenting him as a particularly Italian phenomenon. And foreign journalists dined out on coverage of him. Now they're dining in, in the palace's restaurant with sparkling chandeliers. It was the palace that defined power in Italy for more than 20 years. But it's also for us a way to rewrite that history, maybe, for the country. Says Gustav Hoffer, a foreign press board member and correspondent for the German French Arte Television. Hoffer and others learned the palace was for rent after they got notice that the old foreign press office was being turned into a five star hotel. Italy's president, Sergio Mattarella, inaugurated the new press office this week saying a free press is essential to protecting individual liberty and extinguishing the fires of war. From the heart of Rome, now we can deliver stories and uh, give also this place a uh, different connotation. And I think every place deserves a new start. Megan Williams, CBC News, Rome. You're listening to Your World Tonight from CBC News. I'm Kimberly Gale. You can hear Your World Tonight and other CBC radio programs wherever you are on your favorite podcast app. Tens of thousands of trees in one of Canada's most famous parks are being cut down. A moth infestation in Vancouver's Stanley Park has damaged and weakened trees. The park's distinctive rainforest already looks much different. But as Yvette Bren tells us, some say the cull isn't the right move. A chainsaw chews through a cedar nearly as old as Stanley Park until a massive chunk crashes to the ground that's already punctuated by dozens of stumps. Patty of Vancouver has never seen logging like this in the park. It's very sad. I've been coming to this park since I was a little girl and I've never seen anything like this before. An estimated 160,000 trees are being cut in Stanley Park. Most are smaller western hemlocks, but some are 70 to 80-year-old trees. There hasn't been this many trees down since the windstorm of 2006. The culprit this time, looper moth caterpillar. It'll be two years ago this year. It was a cloud of moths. Bruce Blackwell of BA Blackwell and Associates was contracted to assess the situation with the trees a few years ago. The first priority is public safety. The second priority is long-term fire hazard buildup. So chainsaws have been attacking Vancouver's iconic park for the past few months. They're in a race against bird nesting season. Park Commissioner Tom Digby. We are the busiest urban park in Canada, the second biggest in North America, 18 million visits a year, you cannot simply have towering uh, logs uh, ready to fall on people in busy, crowded places. This park is the jewel of Vancouver. Gillian McGuire is with the Save Stanley Park Society, who have petitioned to save trees and stop traffic in the park. She doesn't think this many trees need to be cut. I mean, obviously, when we see forests being cut down in our neighborhood, we have an emotional reaction. 
But we've gone beyond that and looked at the actual science. She says cutting trees ups fire risk by leaving dead wood and creating fire corridors. UBC Forestry Department head Richard Hamlin says the city made the right move. Uh, now we're in a city park and um, you know we you know we have to think about safety we have to think about uh, you know risk of fire next week replanting of 25,000 seedlings begins but for park goers it will be a long wait hopefully my grandkids and and their kids will be able to enjoy what i've been able to enjoy for trails to feel like a rainforest again Yvette Bren, cbc news vancouver the biggest celebration of Canadian music is happening on the East Coast. The 53rd annual Juno Awards is in Halifax. And it's been a week of live music, songwriter circles, networking and parties. Last night, 42 awards were given out. But it's all building towards tonight, when Album of the Year and other coveted trophies will be awarded. I spoke to our Eli Glasner, who's there. He's going to make you wish he's going to make you wish you were there, too. The big event happens tonight. Who's performing? Who's being honored? Tell us what we can look forward to. I mean, what is great is that, you know, the honor and performances all kind of roll into one. So, for example, Charlotte Cardin's amazing artist from Montreal, uh, she uh, won at the Junos back in 2022. Now she's got a new album. She's back leading the pack with six nominations. But it's not just the nomination. She is performing tonight. Pretty sure we're going to hear that great song, Confetti. Uh, Maestro Fresh West making history uh, as the first rapper to be inducted in the Music Hall of Fame. A lot of people might wonder why it's taken so long, but I have a feeling that the Junos committee have cooked up something very special, a very special version perhaps of uh, Let Your Backbone Slide. There's going to be a beautiful tribute to Robbie Robertson and a Gordon Lightfoot, two amazing icons that we lost, A. Sanabi and Alison Russell. You might have seen her uh, at the Grammys uh, performing. Uh, uh, they're both going to be doing part of these tributes. Nelly Furtado, of course, you may have seen the adverts. She she is not only hosting, but she is also performing. And Kimberly, I'm really excited because she's going to open the show with just this amazing uh, kind of greatest hits. Like, uh, kind of, she described it to me actually as kind of like a Vegas style review. So all of her hits probably rolled into a very tight package just to start the show with a lot of energy. You got Indigenous artists like Jeremy Dutcher. You have a Punjabi artist. I mean, Canadian music is getting more and more global every month. And Karen Ojala is uh, really uh, running up the charts and making fans all around the world. World. He's going to be performing. So kind of almost every musical style you can think of is going to be covered tonight. So, so much to look forward to. But look, Halifax is always a place for great music. Having lived there, I know you can't really walk a downtown block without seeing or hearing yeah. live music. And there are as many legendary artists as there are venues. And I know that you've taken in some of that this week. What stands out for you? You know, good things happen when you leave your hotel room. I, I decided one night on a Friday, I'd finished my assignment, and they have Juno Fest, which means every night in many of the clubs across the city, there are artists playing from across Canada. And I went to a place called the Pacifico. I was asking my friends. They said, oh, you got to stick around for this woman, Jamila. She does kind of a reggae dance hall sort of sound. She came to Halifax seven years ago from Jamaica, and she is related to reggae royalty. And this is a woman who is going places. The Melatones, I'm sure you know the local uh, Halifax funk band, they were part of her sound, so a lot of fun there. And then I went to the Seahorse Tavern. Now, what's unique about this, it has a concert area upstairs and then downstairs in this kind of sweaty basement area I discovered this remarkable artist from Winnipeg. Now, I'm late to the party. A lot of people have already discovered her. Her name is Begonia. She has just these wonderful pipes, an amazing voice, a stage presence like none other. Just to be there, seeing what she was doing with the crowd was remarkable. And I think that's what the, the, the Junos is about, is not just people who are winning the awards, but you know, giving these artists a chance to really make an impact and, and just gain more fans. I hope you carved your initials into a table at the seahorse. <laughs> I didn't think of that. I'm going to go back now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Eli. Alrighty. Senior entertainment reporter Eli Glasner in Halifax. And you can catch all of CBC's Juno's coverage on all CBC platforms, including here on CBC Radio. Whoa, whoa, whoa. East Coast family, every single one of you.
you here is our family. And when June has come, we're going to stand together and show them how we do it over here in Nova Scotia. We'll leave you tonight with a little more from Juno-nominated Jamila. This is East Coast Family. From her set at the Marquee in Halifax a few weeks ago for the CBC music series Road to the Junos. Thank you for listening to Your World Tonight. I'm Kimberly Gale. We blaze the fire anywhere we come from. We say what a bam bam bam. So raise a toast for the East Coast family. We say what a bam bam. Cause it no matter where we go, a silly wall are we. Do you know the meaning of family? I know just blood. You know see the ones we stand up back on me. The sisters keep us with caution and we proud. No boy can bring no chat, me say them up, you watch them moan. No man in